Have you ever prayed a prayer in desperation? A few years ago, the family took a trip to the coast. On the way home, we went through a section of road that was wet from a passing storm. As we went over the low water bridge, the road curved slightly. In the curve, the back tires hit a wet patch and started to slide out. We headed for the edge of the bridge and were kept from dropping off by a thin metal stake. We then spun around and down the grass embankment, spinning about three times. Fortunately, the grass was also wet. There were no boulders or trees or ditches, so we didn't tip over. My first reaction as I gripped the steering wheel, but completely out of control as we spun around, was to scream at the top of my lungs, anticipating a major crash of some sort. But as we continued to spin, I then gathered my thoughts in a desperate prayer. Help us, Jesus! Andrea was in the seat next to me and also screamed out to God. We came to an abrupt stop at the bottom of the embankment and checked that everyone was fine. One of the side windows had smashed against the stake, but for some reason and only for that trip, Andrea had moved Samara's car seat away from that window to the other side of the car. Aidan did get cut by the broken window as he tried to climb out of the car, but otherwise we were all fine. The car was winched up the embankment, had some minor repairs at the tow truck yard, and we continued to drive home. There are a number of cries for help, prayers prayed in desperation that we read in the Bible. A number of psalms reflect David's heart of hopelessness, calling out to Yahweh to save him from his enemies and rescue him from trouble. Think about Jonah desperately calling to the Lord to be rescued from the belly of the fish. We even have that moment when our Messiah cried out from the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is a passage in Psalm 107 that I think is helpful to us. It answers in some way why there is suffering in the world. It is by no means a complete answer, but it gives us some perspective. If we are open to look with the eyes of faith, it gives a number of scenarios of people who experience the enduring love of the Lord, but through the experience of trouble or suffering. There are those lost in the wilderness, deprived of resources and a place to call home. There are those trapped in the guilt of their rebellion, chained to their sin and the consequences of wrong choices. There are those who have afflictions because of turning their backs on God and are close to death. And then there are those who were not sinful but neglectful of God choosing to get on with their own lives, trusting in their own abilities and provisions. Some went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, His wonderful deeds in the deep, for He spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. The context of the psalm is the enduring love of God and a call for us to ponder His ways. The people in this description are not evil or particularly sinful. They are getting on with their jobs and pursuing an honest living. They are like so many in the world today, minding their own business but not tending their hearts. They acknowledge the Creator, but have no need to include Him in their lives. But note something. Where does the storm come from? It says that God spoke and stirred up the storm that resulted in the perilous waves that put them in grave danger. Yes, God didn't simply allow the storms to come. He caused them. He needed to do something extreme to break open the hard hearts of these people, to get them out of control so that their self-dependence would fail and they would have nowhere else to turn 
except in faith to the Lord. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. God has to sometimes get the hardest hearts to break before they will turn to him. He loves people too much to let them think they can do life without him. I have to wonder about COVID and whether this is a moment in history that is sent as a gift to bring the world to submission before the Lordship of Jesus. Like the merchants on the sea, we do everything we can to survive, to beat this, to get back control. And just when one wave of infection seemed to die down, the next is on the horizon, worse than before. Now we know that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Is this simply because people see him in his glory and have this revelation? Or perhaps it is when they have exhausted every other possibility in life and are forced to come to the only inevitable conclusion that Jesus is Lord, that he is the only way, the only truth, the only life. I heard a story this week of a couple who have been struck by COVID. Recently, the wife had asked to be baptized, as she had, after a long time in her twilight years, decided to give her life to Jesus. Her husband listened in on the baptism preparation, but was clear he was not a believer. And then they landed up in ICU. The family was crying out in desperation, not only for their health, but also for his salvation. They were not allowed visitors, but the message that came from the husband was that as soon as he was out of hospital, he wanted to be baptized as well. He never made it. And his wife, although she is recovering, had to mourn her husband alone in hospital. But the family's desperate prayers were answered from an eternal perspective and there is hope in the midst of the crisis. So perhaps we could say, thank you Lord for the storm that brought one of your sons home to you. You see, there is a conclusion to the story in Psalm 107, but it is not automatic. It still takes a decision from the heart that results in the attitude and action of worship. Listen to how the section ends. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. With the eyes of faith, this COVID time is a gift, a time to bring those minding their own business but destined to an eternity without God, to come face to face with their own mortality. It's a wake-up call for all of us to realize again the beauty of this fragile and precious life and to be forever thankful to the one who created it. It is a call to the wayward to come home and for the rebellious to repent. It is a gift fashioned in pain, painted in grief and offered by nail-scarred hands. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing redeeming about this virus. But if we look with the eyes of faith, this season could be a time of redemption and grace. Listen to Isaiah. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, truth has gone out from my mouth, a word that will not be revoked. Every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will swear allegiance. Surely they will say of me, In the Lord alone are righteousness and strength. As believers in Jesus, we are not exempt from the storm, but can be beacons of light to guide people to safety. While our bodies may be susceptible to the virus, our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we do not fear because God is with us. This is one of his names, Emmanuel, 
God is with us. What a comfort, what hope, what joy. And he is the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, said Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus, will live even though he dies. Ours is a hope beyond COVID, beyond the grave, beyond the worst that any man or devil can do. And all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Every desperate prayer is heard, even as our world spins out of control. God hears us when we cry out in the midst of the storm. It's His storm. It will calm when it has done His purpose, and it will result in good things. Let the one who is wise heed these things and ponder the loving deeds of the Lord. Yes, everything He does, He does in love and He does for love. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Heavenly Father, I'll praise you in the storm, because in the very heart of the darkness, I will find your enduring love. Amen. I was sure by now, God, you would have reached down. Wiped our tears away Stepped in and saved the day But once again I say amen And it's still raining And as the thunder rolls I barely hear you whisper through the rain I'm with you And as your mercy falls, I raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. And I'll praise you in this dark, and I will lift my hand, cause you are Strength is almost gone. How can I carry on if I can't find you? But as the thunder rolls, I barely hear you whisper through the rain. I'm with you. And as your mercy falls, I raise my hands and pray. takes away And I'll praise you in this dark And I will lift my hand 
the storm I will pray 